Welcome back around. Hi there, everyone. My name is Frank Kirsch. Uh, I'm one of two co-directors here at the Digital Heart Alliance. And I have with me here Rebecca Convisor, who is going to be the artist of the hour or hour and a half. We'll see how, how long it goes. Uh, but thank you for joining us. Um, we are extremely excited to present um, Creative Expressions, the solo show by Rebecca here. And Rebecca's going to be telling us all about this exhibition, guiding us through. And I will be behind the camera managing it all. If you have any questions that you'd like to pose, um, we will address them. So if you want to go ahead and put them into the chat, um, we can get to them a little bit later. But I'm very excited to have Rebecca here and we can start to learn about all of the work and tremendous personal history that goes into this whole uh, exhibition. So thank you for joining us. And I want to hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Welcome visitors, welcome to the show. First, I want to thank Sam O'Connor, Brian Gersh, Leif Bunchery of the Da Vinci Art Alliance for designing this ele elegant exhibition of my work. It's just beautiful. I also want to thank Veronica Nell, their wonderful publicist. I will be quoting her beautiful writing during this presentation today. I don't remember a time when I wasn't drawing or painting watercolor pictures of the flowers and the vegetables in our gardens or of the houses that, or, or of the horses that grazed in the fields of the farm across the road. My first oil painting when I was eight years old was a portrait of my best pal, my Shetland sheepdog, Pixie. These tapestries and paintings that you see before you today are creative expressions of some of my life experiences. They are art as memoir, art that heals, art that teaches, and art for the sheer pleasure. Now let's begin with art as memoir. Oh. Well, I'm able to walk around. Yep, I can follow you wherever you go. All right, let's begin with my work in progress, the tapestry. Step up, a memoir of my father. A relative reminded me of my days as a carpet designer. And, um, she observed that many parts of my abstract tapestries could become area rug designs if enlarged. She pointed to one and said, this shape looks like it belongs on a staircase. All right, this is the, the plan for the tapestry step up. And it's a magic marker and uh, pencil outline uh, and, and the layout of the geometric process or the geometric plan for an enlargement of a section from one of my abstract tapestries. This is the, the, the collage, the paper mock-up, and this is the partially finished tapestry. It's the work in progress, and you can see the steps going up higher. You can see how the colors migrate first from the idea of light through the darkness, the difficulties, and through the climbing up the stairs and succeeding. Now, where did this come from and how did it start? The relative who was talking to me about my abstract shapes in this tapestry, she said, she's pointed right in the section. She said, look at that, that could make a great staircase rug or an area rug. And she said the word staircase. I immediately remembered as a very young girl watching my father repair a staircase. He was the first person in his family to own property. He bought an old wreck of a house with a staircase that had separated from the side wall. And we can go back here and look at this tapestry and this dark portion in the, in the mock up, the paste up, and how I'm starting to build in the dark wall. This would be the wall, that would be the staircase. All right. The staircase had come away from the side wall and led to 
to the, from the first floor up to the second floor of this house. I saw him and a helper strain as they pried up the staircase from the floor, shoved it back to the side wall, bent down and nailed it in place. As I grew and matured, I learned about the other steps up that my father had taken as a teenage immigrant from Belgium. Uh, symbolize the progress of moving upward. My father also admired fine needlework and brightly colored fabrics. His father, the grandparent I never knew, was a tailor. He had a tailor shop in Belarus and then set one up in Chicago. Um, his shop was set up on Maxwell Street in the tenements, and my father and with his mother and six other siblings lived there. Even though my father moved up and out of the tenements, he still returned there to purchase the brightly striped plaid shirts and t-shirts and sweaters for my brother. I loved the colorful clothing too and wore the garments as hand-me-downs, beautifully colored, richly colored and soft from wear. Each season, I could hardly wait for him to outgrow his clothing. I love to hold the yarn and touch the texture of the stitches. And this is the yarn that I work with. It's wool tapestry yarn. It's three ply, one, two, three. And there we go, three ply. And when I want to make color mixes or do shading and shadows, I will split the, the strands and put in different colored plies to make tweeds and shades and tints and shades and shadows. And here's some That's other some examples example. of how I do that to add depth sparkle and color. I love it. I love mixing colors like that. It's almost painting, painting with wool. And you can see from here, if you look closely, you can see the way I've mixed colors subtly or more boldly. And let's, let's walk over here to some of the other colors. Okay, you can see some of the mixes in the shades going on here and up there, making the dark shadows even richer with the mixture of different colors. Now I want to talk about, this is my father's tapestry and it was a memoir, an art about memoir. This one is art about healing. Many people who see my work ask how and why I began making needlepoint tapestries. Part of the answers come from Veronica Nell's writing about this show. She wrote the following. In the late 1990s, Rebecca Kahnweiser began making needlepoint tapestries in order to process her battle with breast cancer. The stitching helped Rebecca recover her arm and hand strength while the infinite range of beautiful colors filled her with optimism. Weaving her life experience through yarn, each tapestry became an homage to her life and the relationships she has formed along the way. The dramatic contrast of light and dark and bold colors, the intricate patterns, all work together to tell Rebecca's story. And so that's, enjoy this one. One of the ways I feel like I'm creating depth is a lot of the shapes float. They're in the composition, but they're unattached. And here is, pardon me, here. 
There is another one that I actually call floating steps. This is a precursor to the, our, the work in progress. Floating steps and floating images. And if you look very carefully, there's a little cat lurking in the, in the sky, the tail, the cat, the ears, the face, and so on. I love to have fun with my artwork. I love the whole process. Okay, these tapestries, these abstracts were not planned in advance. The thick needles and the large grid canvas made it easier for me to experiment with colors, shapes, movement, and space. I quickly understood that needlepoint compositions could be flat and static. The real challenge I'd soon discover would be to create a unified composition with depth and movement. This challenge is renewed with each new tapestry. I create, all right? I've discussed art as memoir. I've discussed, discussed art that heals. And now I would like to talk about art that teaches. Let me just follow up here. This is my alphabet tapestry. It took me four years to complete. The only planning ahead I did was to lay out the letters with the same type size and same type shape and to make the rectangles in which they reside more or less the same in dimensions. It stretches a little bit, but more or less the same. In terms of all the color work and the stitching, the patterns, and the use of complementary colors. That's all from spontaneous thinking while I'm working on the pieces. I like to play games with colors that pop out and colors that recede and break the rules in terms of color theory. A lot of the colors in the front would normally be considered cool colors but I heat them up, the blues and the greens, with added, the added sparkle of their complements. And I use complementary colors together in background and in foreground. I want the vibration of uh, red and green, and I want the vibration of purple and orange, and so on, and that's what happens. It's the alphabet tapestry is about communication. And it's also an expression of the gratitude for receiving an awesome education from many talented art educators. Now, when people look at my resume and they see that I had to go to three undergraduate schools to get my undergraduate degree, there's a lot of eyebrow raising and nose rubbing and questions about what did you flunk out? Were you kicked out? Uh, well, how come it took you three tries? Well, I was married to my husband and he kept getting transferred, corporate transfers. And he was a chemical engineer with a big corporation. And the word IBM for most people is means I've been moved. <laughs> so that was explained why I had to go to three undergraduate schools. But when I did, I also got into art departments that had different points of view and different philosophies and taught art history and color theory in many different ways in a variety of ways. And I was the beneficiary of all of this exposure to such open-minded and creative thinking. I did rewrite my resume to be a little more explanatory about that. But uh, I learned color theory the principles of creating space, movement, and contrast. I learned how to unify compositions and express life experiences at the same time. And each letter is its own composition. It's full of life, color, 
space in the room. Now I'd like to move over to another way I see it art with my graphic design. These are paintings, believe it or not. I was a painter before I became a fiber artist. I still paint. Uh, I managed to do one or two large paintings every year because I love to work in bright colored paints. But these paintings express my admiration for human ingenuity. The building of structures that literally leap across rivers and canyons. I, I have tried to capture literally the view from the bridge uh, that, I, that I have, the colors I see and the feeling of space that I experience while approaching and driving on a bridge. And there are some other things here that are very exciting for me. First of all, this is uh, when I used to, we used to drive from New Jersey to visit our daughter in White Plains, New York. We either cross the Washington Bridge or the Tappan Zee Bridge. And if we did it at twilight, and it was in late fall, um, in November or early December, there could have been many times a harvest moon, a bright orange moon, when in a position when it was the closest to the earth, and we drive over the Hudson. And occasionally, on two occasions that I vividly remember, we got to see also the aurora borealis, the green aurora borealis, and it was reflected in the Hudson River. And I never forgot how much pleasure I got from that view. And similar feelings here of going living in the New York area at one point. We actually got transferred ten times across America. Um, was the tribe. The, the, the Triborough Bridge and the other bridges uh, going. And I had fun with the view from one of the bridges and seeing the other ones. But I loved this bright ray of sunlight. These are sort of exaggerated forms of some of the uh, apartment units, housing units. But there's a was a blue bridge. And I thought, wow, make it blue, put it behind this background and see what if you can make the space, make it three dimensional. And I, I did, and I'm very proud of that. <laughs> and I also used metallic paint for some of the details on the bridge. And in the evening when the light is low, this metallic actually glows through even, I have some silver paint here too. It actually picks up the light, little bit of light and glows. And that's a lot of fun. And that's, for me, that's art for pleasure. Um, I'd like to take you to look at this, one of the smaller tapestries, which I have had a lot of fun with making. Once again, creating art for pleasure. And it's, it was a, my visit to my mother-in-law. She always had hot coffee pot on the stove, and she always had flowers in the face at least in one, sometimes it was three or four vases. And she had two flowers in a cut glass vase. And she had it against a wall, which had a pattern, wallpaper pattern. And there was light, you know, an area and pretty. And I thought, look at how the cut glass surfaces change the design form, the flower stems and the patterns behind the vase. And, and I carried it up. I just didn't want a straight stem. So these are sort of my interpretation of leaves in this style. And also I like to repeat colors in the composition, but be able to put them in the background. This is bolder, this is farther behind and create space like that. And every time I look at this particular tapestry, it makes me feel good. I remember my mother-in-law who was absolutely my best friend. Florence, it was Florence, and a very lovely woman with a great sense of humor. And I remember this face, and it gives me pleasure. Uh, now, I'd like to uh, finish my little soliloquy here with the area rug that's on the floor. And 
we were able to geometry in motion. There's a lot more than geometry going on. My major source of income was as a carpet designer. For a while, I actually did handmade rugs as well. I did design consultation work for USAID subcontractor in Nepal to help the factories produce contemporary area rugs that could be more attractive to the Western market, that's America and Western Europe. This area rug was one of the samples I designed and it was manufactured in Nepal. It has high pile and it's carved to give the rug dimensionality. Now, um, I'm about to conclude my part of this talk, but I, I do wanna make one statement that I totally believe in. Uh, art has given me joy, it's educated me, it saved my life, and it's given me, it continues to give me happiness uh, and to provide for me more. Uh, what, what, what really makes me happy is if my art gives someone else a few minutes of pleasure, of enjoyment, then my art is totally successful. It's a Halloween success. So thank you. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Sam, do we have any questions in the chat that we can talk about? Not yet. Um, I posted in the chat asking if I want to ask Rebecca questions. No one's posted anything yet. So, Everyone prepare your questions, send them in. Brian, do you have a couple of questions for Rebecca? Or I certainly I? do. Um, so here's where my naivety shows through, uh, being simply a painter and not a fabric artist. Can you tell me, and uh, by extension, everyone else, a little bit about this process of needlepoint, as if we don't know how to needlepoint already? <laughs> well, first of all, uh, in needlepointing, you work on a, a, some people call it a backing, some people call it a canvas, but it, it's uh, not uh, tightly closed weaved woven. It is actually, we can, can you, I don't know how close up we can get to this. Yeah. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a miniature mathematical grid. And this one is, 10 spaces to the square in, to the inch. So it's 10 by 10 would be a hundred, it would be a hundred little spaces in that. All right. And uh, you stitch through the grid and it's called a tent stitch. You see this diagonal line, which just convenient, here's a cleaner one. It conveniently happens to be there. The stitches are on a diagonal they cross the joints of the grid. And you can see it here, how these stitches are on a diagonal. And this is a square grid, it's not diagonal grid. And I always change direction. Some of the stitches go this way, some of the stitches go in the opposite direction so that the tapestry will not warp as I'm making it so that it will not be distorted pulling in one direction. And uh, I use, it's called the tent stitch. There are, like I said, many other stitches in needlepoint, but the, stent, the tent stitches work so well for me, I never bothered to explore the other ones. At some point I might, but maybe not. And can you tell me a little about um, the color here that you've selected? Uh, being in this room is um, uh, being kind of absolutely surrounded by high saturation colors, incredibly high key. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about how that plays into um, your work and, and why you selected uh, such saturated colors? Well, first of all, uh, let me talk to you a little bit quickly about the yarn. The information that I'm about to give you will absolutely blow your mind. I have not purchased new yarns for myself in almost a decade. When I first started this in the late 1990s, 
think the first tapestry I made was in 1998 while I was still being treated. Um, I became acquainted with the owner of the yarn shop and she was wonderful. She taught me the 10 stitch and she helped me pick the right backings and thicker needles to use and so on. And we became friends. Well, about 10 years ago, maybe nine years ago, she sold her business. And I had no idea she was gonna do that. She called me one day and she said, I, I'm selling my business and I want you to come to the shop. I cannot sell yarn skeins that I pre-cut. And what they did is they would get, this is a, not a good example, but they would get yarn skeins that were fully joined so that they could be put on winders and made into yarn balls. And what she did is she would sell her yarn by the strand, 20 or 30 strands for 15 or 20 cents a piece, whatever. And the new owner only wanted full skeins, none that were cut. And she had this huge inventory of cut yarn skeins. And she said, I don't want to throw it out. I give it to you. I filled, we had a, a Corolla, a, not a Corolla, a Camry, <laughs> bad walking advertising. I filled a Camry with uh, uh, garbage bags, huge bags, bushel baskets, anything, cartons, anything I could quickly grab. And I went there two days in a row and loaded her stock. I eventually had 12 bins. The bins are what, 40 inches by two feet or something? Loaded, <laughs> loaded. And for the next two years, the granddaughters who lived close enough would come over once or twice a month and help me tie the strands in wine <laughs> all so that at least I could compress it a little bit. So I have it, and these, the tapestry yarn that I use is 100% uh, Persian wool. It's just beautiful. Patternan was the major supplier. After we moved to Philadelphia, and I be, people were, we befriended people and found people with things interest in common. A lot of, I met a lot of other embroiderers and needle pointers, and they were working in silk. And they said to me one day when they heard the story about all the yarn, you know, I have these leftovers from some of my projects. Would you like them? Well, I, I've never turned out a gift like that. <laughs> so from time to time, I find a door, a bag hanging on my doorknob with little contributions of this. And this silk, it adds a certain amount of sparkle you see this outline here? Okay, that's this silk that I've wrapped around the uh, other plies and filled in as a strand. And I've got it uh, in other places. There's some more of it and some more of it. And I'm planning on using, so I have some in the yellow, some with yellow and orange. Here's a piece of it. And here's another one. Look how it sparkles next to the purples. Um, first, I checked with the uh, company, the Textile Conservancy, the blocks um, things, to see if I could combine the two. And they said there's no problem with that. So um, that, that's exactly what I did. And it's added that sparkle. It's like almost like experimenting with metallic paint to get a glow. Um, I have a question from the chat. Jenny Bernhardt? Yes. Um, she asked, do you have a favorite piece on this exhibit? Oh, um, thank you for the question, Ms. Bernhardt. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, I actually, love each piece so much, love working on it so much and doing it so much. I, I almost feel like, especially when I sit down and I look at that painting, I say, thank you. <laughs> um, I love them all. Each one of them is a major triumph for me. 
because I was able to stay at a standard. I will not rush through anything. If, it is, if I'm not happy with it, I won't declare it finished. Uh, and it's a triumph for me because I'm, I'm physically able to do it and that, that it's actually made my day. Um, I, I have done some, a lot of volunteer work in, wherever we landed with Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, um, you know, doing stage sets at the local elementary school, whatever I could use my skills to volunteer. Uh, about 10 years ago, I established a problem in drug court, and it is now called Recovery Court in New Jersey, a program of creative writing and artwork. And we founded, founded a magazine with them called In Our Shoes, where this artwork and writing is made available to the public in a very nice magazine. And one of the writing topics at some point was, what is your family motto or what is your motto? What, do you live, what are the principles you live by? And uh, one of the writers wrote, I tell my son every morning, it's a great day to have a great day. And I have adopted, I didn't know often that motto, but I'm glomming onto it <laughs> because I can look forward to doing this artwork every day as much as I want or as little as I want. It's there for me. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. Speaking of making this work perhaps every day, how long might some of these pieces take to create? Well, that's a really good question too. I'm what you call a perfectionist. Some people call me obsessive. Compulsive, I'm a perfectionist. I use a T square and a triangle and several other drafting tools to make sure that these bridge supports and their or these bridge hanging cables, hanging cables were perfect, that they suited the design and the craftsmanship as well as painterly qualities. It took me eight months to paint this painting and to get it right and to do the colors the way I want to be total control. And I just work like that. This one, by contrast, I was zipping along. It just fell into place and it took me a month. It was just unusual. These tapestries, um, there are actually four other tapestries that are not in the show, and they represent four separate words, years of working. It could take me um, four or six months to work on a painting because I'm working on it. I only make one of these a year because that's all I can afford to pay for the blocking and finishing. So I take my time and I love every minute of it. And sometimes I will take a break and start a painting. You know, the two different types of medium complement each other very well. So that to answer your questions, I'm pretty slow in producing. <laughs> I mean, I think you go very fast because I've been telling like all of our visitors, I couldn't imagine spending four months on that. It would take me four years to do that. And I think that's really incredible that it takes you, like even with you taking your time, it's still such a speedy process in comparison to the way other people work. Well, you know, it's always there for me. And uh, actually a day that I don't do a little bit of stitching, is a day that I sort of wish I had. Yeah. <laughs> Rebecca, do you want to talk a little bit about um, how you get them blocked? Yes. I think you've mentioned it a couple of times throughout this conversation, but I don't think the audience knows. Well, uh, the rug is separate, and I'll answer that question after I answer these. 
The blocking and finishing is critical to any textile work. Some textile work doesn't need blocking and finishing, but for the ones that do, uh, the process is, is pretty rigorous. First of all, the stitching, you have to do the best quality stitching you can. The backing is never looks good. And one of the, and during my early years of doing this, one of the women who worked in the shops, you know, I was sort of like, why does it look so messy back here? She said, no one looks at the back, <laughs> but it does influence how the face of the piece looks. All right, when I finish, first of all, the backing that I buy, let me back up and do this, the edges have to be secured, uh, either sewn and taped or just taped so they don't unwrap to protect it. And you have to have a certain amount of space that you don't stitch in, you don't go right to the edge because when it's blocked, it's stretched. Yeah. Now, the first thing they do when I send it to the textile conservancy is they study it, they test some of the wool for color fastness in, you know, in the corner or on part of the back. Uh, and then they vacuum it with the special vacuum cleaner to pull out any debris or dust. And so I'm considering how long I work on them and where, you know, I have a, a bag and how many times I stuff it in the bag to take on a plane or whatever. Uh, there's usually debris that needs to be vacuumed up. Once that's done, uh, they, they stretch it, they wet it down and stretch it on boards and they true up the sides and the edges, make sure everything is level and even and as good as they can do. And then it has to dry. Wool, wool has interesting qualities. Uh, when you, Finish when wool is finished, even in the manufacturer clothing, it is it is blocked and stretched and steamed sometimes. And the wool it shrinks a little bit and it puffs up. It's called fulling. And when the fulling is is completed and the tapestry is dry, it's you pretty much can count on it staying perfectly lined up perfectly straight and so on. And then some of the tapestries are fixed with Velcro at the top and they hang and they they have a lining up on the back, but they hang from the Velcro top and they remain flexible if need be. They can be rolled up. I don't advise doing that, but they're not a, stretched on a board. However, the bigger tapestries uh, are happier and seem to function better stretched on a, or this is stretched over an aluminum wafer, they call it aluminum wafer. And it is, did I not have that one? No, it is uh, stapled to the back uh, with there's lining, there's a piece of, a very thin piece of like balsa wood and so on, so that there is a little bit of give for the weather or expanding a little bit in humidity and so on. Uh, in, the, in the more than 26 years that I've been working with the textile conservancy, there's never been a problem. They've been a pleasure, a real pleasure. In the beginning, we tried, actually this one, we tried to do this one with just a Velcro, Slat and Velcro on the back, and it did become distorted. Maybe it was the design or a shift in the stitches or whatever. So we I mean, took it back and they did mount this on a wafer. This is another story. <laughs> um, this, you had, I had to be able to handle it to transport it, move it, and so on. So I'm putting this on a, on a wafer wouldn't work. And I didn't want to split it anywhere or anything like that. So the solution they came up with is that there's a Velcro strip all the way down the middle 
and on the corners to hang it on a wall. It's been up there mm, mm, about three months. And it, if, it, if it hasn't distorted by now, it's not going to. So, you know, and, and the other thing is, it's I did something here I will never do again. <laughs> I made this in pieces and then joined the pieces. And that was not a good thing to do. So I am designing the companion for this piece on mathematics. And I'm all, it's going to all be one piece, but it will still be hung loose. It won't be mounted on a board. But it, it worked out, you know, it worked out. Remember, what were some of the issues that you encountered when you were joining these pieces? Oh, uh, other than wanting to run down the street screaming. <laughs> uh, well, um, uh, there was a lot of distortion in the, in the backing material. Some of it stretched out too much. You can see that whoever did that too. And uh, some of the places had unravel. I had not protected them enough. So I had to come back in and weave in sort of a backing for it. And sometimes I had to put in a splice or a piece over another piece to strengthen it. That's probably why it took four years. <laughs> I spent a whole year doing nothing but joining the pieces. And then I, I don't regret it though. I, I'm just so. I mean, it's beautiful. Well, it's, it's, well, it's beautiful. I agree with you. It's also a ton of fun. You know? <laughs> right. So, anything else? Uh, well, you think you're going to talk about the carpet a little bit yes. too? Yes. Well, um, this is, uh, I have not gotten down and counted the knots, which I should do. Um, this is probably a hundred knot rub, which means that. It's the same grid as the, the work in progress, but it, it was not a grid. It was made on a loom with a warp and a, and a weft. And it was hand knotted through. And the design was on paper blown up full scale behind it. Now, the, the thing to admire here is today we have computers. Things can be blown up. You know, you can take something very small and accurate and blow it up very large and accurately. They didn't have that technology in Nepal. For the most part, they didn't have electricity or running water. You know, and uh, uh, it was amazing that they could actually produce a design. Uh, the people in Nepal, the manufacturers, had been their market, major market was East Germany and the Eastern Bloc countries. And those people were a different kind of perfectionist. They did not like ombres or streaked colors. They didn't like colors that had more of a, an in and out look. That, you know, look, they didn't want anything to look handmade. And they would finish these rugs and they lay them out on the factory floor with pots of dye. And if there was any color irregularity in any one of the colors, especially the background colors, they would hand dye that spot. And the other thing they did, which, which was quite miraculous, is that they had clippers. And when we started talking about dimensionality, they went in and they clipped these grooves by hand, with hand clippers. That would never happen <laughs> here. And they did a beautiful job. I mean, it's just gorgeous. And it also, it does have this handmade quality that it, the Western world actually prizes. Yeah. So, so that, um, but uh, the purpose of this wacky design was to help them break out of uh, patterns, traditions, not to destroy or deny their traditional designs, but to give them additional options. Well, they did reproduce this in beiges and browns and so on. They sort of came halfway. <laughs> and they, I, I designed other ones with gigantic leaves and flowers, with black backgrounds and bright red colors, you know, and bright green. And they did that in beiges and grays and so on, but they did it. 
and they changed a lot of the design motifs that way. When you do consulting work like that, it's important that a consultant be very open-minded about it too, because then they bring out the best and you can bring out other ways of seeing things that you never thought of, which is good, very good. How long were you over there helping them like design? Um, I went in and out of the country for, two, for three weeks at a time from 90 through 92 to 93. Not, not a lot. But it was significant enough, and I loved every minute. It was fascinating. The workday in Kathmandu starts around 9:30 in the morning. You do have a pollution pad, a pollution problem. Their vehicles were these three-wheeled scooters that were encased, and uh, they only used twice cracked kerosene for fuel which meant that there were clouds of black smoke from exhaust. People wore masks. Everybody wore masks in the morning during rush hour. Uh, the other thing that was interesting was that there were Tibetan factories in Kathmandu, and there were Indian factories in Kathmandu. Nepalese people are, are sort of a blend of those two cultures and so on. The Tibetan factories, men and women were equal. They had women foremen, uh, women uh, running the businesses, women salesmen, and so on, as well as workers. They did not allow child labor. They only, uh, the labor they had, you had to be 14, and you had to live on the campus of the factory and go to school. They had school, they had soccer leagues, and so on. The Indian factories, had a different philosophy about this type of thing. And the men were not in dominant management positions. There was evidence of child labor. And there was, uh, they had brighter colors in the Indian factories and finer details and designs and more knots per inch. But their wool quality was not as sturdy as the Tibetan wools. And the Tibetans also used natural sheep wool a lot, which is great, very beautiful shades of warm grays and beiges. And they it had in it what we call slugs. Those are, um, well, this one doesn't have, this is, this is a tweeted sweater. The slugs would be uh, bigger sort of lumps of different colors, which made the, the, the natural rich, it was beautiful. So they had differences in their, in their approach to things. The, the Indian factories did not have a school for the children. And I also witnessed a woman weaver give birth to a child, get up from her room, give birth to a child. The other women stopped their work for a while. They washed the baby and the woman rested. She tucked the child in, the child began a nurse, and she went back to work. That never happened in Tibet, the Tibetan factories. So it's a different difference of the culture type of thing. And that all happened after your time at the Institute, the Fashion Institute? That was during. Um, I was at, at FIT until 1996 uh, when uh, I actually. Um, I wasn't doing tapestries until that time, 98 with Rikers. That's when I started to um, realize I was uh, having to deal with cancer again. So the first time was in the 80s. But you do what you gotta do. And I get the joy of being here today. So a lot, lot of good stuff. <laughs> do we have any more uh, comments in the chat that we can uh, address? Oh, if anyone else has any comments that you want to um, add to the chat, add it now. Um, otherwise, do you have any last comments you want to say, Rebecca? Well, I would like to say thank you very much for coming and thank you, Da Vinci, for this whole experience. It's been wonderful. And when you get up every day 
Every day is a good day to start a good day. <laughs> uh, Kit Reed says, Rebecca, thank you for sharing your afternoon and providing us a very informative conversation about your vision and creative process for your intricately beautiful and vibrant creations, which I agree with Kit. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kit. Um, Penny says, thank you very much for your work and your presentation. I enjoyed both very much. Barbara Allen says, absolutely lovely art and a wonderful talk from a terrific artist. <laughs> well, thanks so much. Sam, would you like to tell us how long the exhibition is going to be up in this space and how people can come visit it? Okay, so... Um, we're open Wednesdays through Sundays from 11 to 5 every day. Um, Rebecca's show is open through, is it February 2nd? I don't know, I've got my phone on here right now. <laughs> you threw so. out a question at me that I was not prepared for. Um, <laughs> yes, I was right, February 2nd. <laughs> Um, so yeah, stop by the gallery anytime. Um, oh, Barbara Allen wants to get in touch with you. So Barbara, um, send me an email and I'll connect you with Rebecca. <laughs> um, info at davinciartalliance.org or you can find mine or Brian's emails on the staff page. Um, thank you everyone for being here. All and right. thank you, Rebecca. Oh my goodness, thank you very much. It's been absolutely wonderful. I mean, I, I already said this to you outside of your artist talk, but it has been a joy for us cool to walk thank through your you. exhibition every day. Yeah, thank you. Good. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks so much, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. I hope you can come visit the exhibition in, purpose, in person for the rest of the month. Have a good one, everyone. Bye.